Welcome everybody to episode two of the MongoDB section of the series. This one, we're going to be learning how we can reuse our MongoDB connection across multiple files and how we can query MongoDB for a specific customer, which we'll use for our parameterized page. By the end of this video, we will have this page working the same way with a new structure for the code, and we'll be able to take one of these IDs here and pass it in to get the information for a specific customer showing up on the front end. Right now, it's just going to 404. So I've been using this doc as a guide a bit to grab some of the different code and files that they've been using. So the ability to get an application going with MongoDB from the start is fairly easy. However, we already have a project going and we're already using MongoDB in our code. So we're not gonna start with a completely new project, but I want to create a new project and take some pieces from it that we can use in our own application. So let's execute this code in a terminal. And this here is the name, you can call it whatever you want. I'm just gonna call this sample. Now we can say code sample to open that in Visual Studio Code. Now there's a few files in here that I care about. Specifically, there's one in this lib directory called mongodb.ts. Quick clarification between .ts and .tsx, which we've been using, is that .tsx supports JSX, which is the HTML JavaScript mix that we use in React and Next.js. Well, this is more of a supporting file that's just going to have JavaScript code, so we can leave it at .ts. However, this would work if it was .tsx because a .ts file can be a .tsx file. Hopefully, that makes sense. But either way, what we're going to do is we're going to take this code, and what this does is it creates the Mongo client in a single location and that's going to be used throughout our application. That way we have a cached connection and we can reuse that without having to reconnect to the database every time we want to do something, which is an optimization. And in that case, I'm just going to use some of the existing code MongoDB has already provided. So I will copy this code. I'm gonna follow their pattern of putting it in this lib directory. Over here in our project, we will create a new folder, lib, and inside of there, I will say mongodb. TS, exactly as they had it. Pasting this code here, so far, so good. The other thing we're going to need to do is set up a local environment variable, which we can put inside of a file. I'll show you how to do that. But first, I wanna fix the existing problems with this code. Element implicitly has an any type because of this. Now, I don't know what, what this means, actually. I wasn't able to figure it out because I'm basically as dumb as a doorknob. But I will show you a quick fix. But just for clarity, I'm not like, a really dumb doorknob I mean I'm at least like this smart okay so give me some credit most of you guys watching this are probably this level so just back off so what we're gonna do is just ignore all the TypeScript errors in this file and we'll be good to go so I will show you how to do that yeah we're sacrificing some of the benefits of TypeScript but we're also going to get rid of these errors so it's slash slash at TS dash no check and that will remove it this is kind of like putting tape over an engine light in your car. It doesn't fix the problem, but you know, it kind of fixes the problem. So that's what we're doing here. If anybody knows the fix for this, drop it in the comment section below. The next is creating an environment variable. Now you could of course just connect to it directly typing in the URI here. However, this file is set up better than how we've done it because this is going to allow you to use a database locally and a database in production that are different. That way you're not screwing up the production database as you're developing, you know, testing out all your stupid little experiments on your local computer, and then you're like, oh no, oops, I deleted the database. Don't do that. So what we're gonna do is we're going to define a URI for local development, which we're going to put in a file here. When you go to deploy your application, you'll be able to put in a production database path here, which will take precedence over your local environment file. So what we're gonna do is we'll create that and we'll say .env .local. And you'll need to name it exactly like that. Inside of here, we can define our connection string. And specifically, we want to assign it to mongodb underscore URI in all caps. So we'll paste that there and then paste the connection string right after. So we used our connection string once. You can go grab it from your MongoDB cloud instance if you need, but I already have it. So let's go into index and copy this value here. And 
I'm going to take it here and you're not going to use the quotes. So I will paste that right here. Now you look and see, I got all these problems and this is actually just from a dumb extension that I use to help me not be dumb, which is a spell checker. So I can ignore that just by unchecking this or I could just disable that extension. Now the MongoDB file should be able to read that connection string, which will be used throughout this code. And inside of our file that was originally requesting that MongoDB client with the connection string, we can replace this line here. What are we gonna replace it with? Well, we are going to use this client promise that is exported from this file. And that will create a new Mongo client and say client.connect. So let's go ahead and in our file, we will say const Mongo client. And I'm naming this to be the same as how I've used it through this code so we don't have to change anything. And then we will say await client promise. This is going to need imported. So import it from that file from dot dot slash dot dot lib mongodb. And now everything should work the same way. Let's go ahead and restart the server, which I think is an important step when running code that uses your local environment variables. So if you look closely, it said loaded environment from, and then it has that environment local file. So that's done on initial load. So now we should be able to visit our site. We're still not getting individual customers because we haven't built that functionality, but we can get all of our customers and we're using our new database setup. So that's cool. There is one more change that I wanted to make and that has to do with how I named our data. So I created a database and a collection using uppercase letters. And just thinking about the conventions for MongoDB, I think it would be better to have these lowercase. This is a totally optional step, kind of like paying taxes, like it's good if you do it, but if you just leave it as is, it's totally fine. So we're going to lowercase these, and to do that, I'm just going to create a new database, customers, and collection name, customers, create. And it broke probably because I'm either not logged in still. I think I need to remove this one first. So now I will create customers and customers. And I will go add in the existing data we already had. Okay, so I recreated some data and now I'll just adjust our connection string. So I'll show you how to do that real quick. That's going to be in our local environment variable file and just changing our database to a lowercase c. And then in our actual index file, we will want to access the lowercase c collection. Restarting our server just to confirm the new connection string is working. We should be able to get our new and improved data. And it looks like you can see the industry for John Smith then show up. So let me just check that industry. I like manually typed the colon. So I will fix that and that should do the trick. So now we can go refresh our page and it's back to how we expected. Sorry for that little sidetracking, but I just thought that was a good step. What I want to do now is I want to use this Mongo client in another location, specifically inside of the ID version of this, where we are still using Axios to request data from an API. Instead, we should just get data from our database. So we can probably copy over some of that code. It's going to be fairly similar. So we will copy this here and bring it here. We're not going to need this section for Axios, so I will replace it with this here. And we will import client promise. We will modify our query, so instead of just having an empty find, we will pass in an object here. And this will have a quoted underscore ID property, and we are specifically looking for params ID. However, remember the unique format of MongoDB object IDs? So what we're going to do is we're actually going to pass this in to a new object ID. And this is going to be imported from MongoDB. And I want to make sure I get my parentheses set up right. So let's go ahead and import this from MongoDB. And then we should just be able to return data directly as we did in the index file as well. All right, so let's try to figure out these typing problems. What we can do is we can say what type of data is expected from this query. And what we can do is we can say that we only expect a single object versus an array using find one and saying as whatever type it might be, such as customer, 
that will fix all of our problems because we are expecting a customer type to be assigned to that customer property defined up here in this props type. So that should fix all of our problems and we should be good to go. Only way we can know for sure is to test it out. So let's head over to the local host. Let's grab a customer ID and we will paste that here. And you can see that that did not work However, I think we're close. We did get the data returned that we were expecting. This goes back to that weird parsing problem we had in the previous episode where we actually did JSON parse of JSON stringify of the data. So let's go ahead and copy this here or type it out and I will paste that here. And we will also take a look at the errors here in a moment. Right now, this isn't going to catch any Axios errors because we're not using Axios. But one step at a time. Let's go ahead and check out the site. And you can see we get customer John Smith. Awesome. So it's working and we are printing out the customer name. So I want to see what happens if we put in some bogus data here. First, I wanted to add some spaces here so we can just clearly see the output. If we just say customer 500, well, it just says customer and doesn't display their name. It doesn't 404 like we would expect. And we're not getting any data outputted here in the terminal which you know we would have expected from this console log. So what I believe is happening is an exception is being thrown and the current code, it's not an Axios error anymore. So it's just returning an empty object. And we didn't have the actual customer word being conditionally displayed. So it's showing it all the time. So it would look like this as a better setup. Now we're not going to get anything show up on the page, but really it should 404. So we need to take a look at our errors now to figure out how do we check to see if the equivalent for the Axios of 404, but now with MongoDB. Let's start by console logging the error. This will allow us to get some more information from the console. So when we request something, it said loading for a second and we see the error in the console. And this is actually a problem complaining about the string not being the right size. So what happens if we actually try this with a valid length, but not a document that we expect? And now let's see what our error is. In this case, our data is now null. So if we 404 essentially with our MongoDB request, we just get null as a return. So what we could do is just check for null, and if that's the case, then we would just return not found inside of Next.js. So let's start with that. We'll say if data is false, return, and this is going to have not found set to true. Now this should 404. And you can see we get a 404 page. Yay! Now let's talk about the other problem is if we put some bogus data that's not of the right length. You could throw an error and say, you know, something went wrong, but I think it actually would make sense just to say not found as well. So if this catch is hit, and let's say if error instance of bson type error, and this is going to need imported, which they don't have the correct suggestion here. So let's import this manually. Import bson type error from bson. Now that should hit here. And what we can do is we can return a not found being true. We're not going to revalidate because it'll never be correct since it's not the right structure. However, for this one up here, where data is just null, we could actually have a revalidate. So that would make sense. Every minute we could check to see if that data is now found. Or at least I should say, at least a minute before the cache is invalidated. All right, so far so good. And then if I get down here, I'm just going to throw the error. And I want this to be inside of that cache. So now we should be able to make this request and we get a 404. If you wanted to simulate what would happen if something else went wrong, you could just comment this section out for a brief moment. Which, by the way, if you want the shortcut to comment out many lines, and I know my brain's all over the place in this video, but ADHD, what are you going to do? Uh, command KC to comment it and then K you to uncomment it, probably control on Windows. So we'll comment those lines out 
And this is what would happen if we didn't have that. We would just get an unhandled runtime error, which in production isn't going to look quite like that. So let's close this and say npm run build, npm run start. We would get something like this, which you can probably customize, of course. So this is a 500 server error, and you could create a custom 500 if you want to research that. So it brings up the question, do you catch things inside of get static props? Well, I think it's probably appropriate to catch this one where a clear misformatting of the ID can return not true, but it's not really your responsibility to catch everything inside of here. And in fact, you could leave out this entirely. And in that situation, Next.js is automatically gonna take care of it with an error page. That's all I got in this episode. Definitely stay tuned for the next one. Hopefully this video has been helpful and definitely don't forget to subscribe.